Egypt is called the gift of the Nile. The river winds through Egypt, carving a fertile path from south to north. It's the reason there is any life at all in this otherwise desert country, because it's the only source of water for 80 million people. Today, Egypt faces a crisis. There simply isn't enough water. Growth along the river, both in Egypt and in the nine other countries it passes through, means increased demand on a limited resource. It's a situation which has sparked warnings from the Egyptian government, international water experts, and U.S. intelligence agencies who warn that there is a potential threat of war over water in the region. The United Nations projects that by the year 2025, the amount of water Egypt receives will be reduced by 20%. This looming crisis has the potential to pull apart the very fabric of Egyptian life. From the fishermen whose livelihoods depend on the Nile, to the farmers who use the Nile's water to irrigate their crops, to the city dwellers whose taps may run dry. It's a crisis that could threaten Egypt's very existence. The water supply is limited absolutely limited. Richard Tutwiler is a professor specializing in natural resource management at the American University in Cairo. This country is one of those few, very few countries in the world that has no rainfall whatsoever to speak of. And it's dependent on a source of water, of renewable water that's coming from somewhere else, from neighbors. And yet, the demand for that water is unlimited and it is increasing, increasing, increasing. And by that I mean the, the human population of the country is growing. So we're adding about 100,000 people every three weeks. Egypt's population is mushrooming. It has increased by 41% since the early 1990s, which compounds the problem, not enough water. So I think we need to reduce dependency on uh, the, the water from the River Nile. Dr. Magda Kandel is the executive director of the Egyptian Center for Economic Studies. She explains how Egypt's desert geography plays a role in the crisis. If you look at the map, it provides you a very clear explanation for the density of the population and the cultivated area. This is a very historic country with a lot of uh, civilization and many years of, in history. But uh, population density has been clustered along the River Nile because of water resources. The map shows just how tiny that sliver of fertile land really is. And the population must balance that small space with all of its agricultural needs. With a single source of water in what is otherwise a desert country, the question of how to preserve and sustain the Nile has been a top priority for every leader since Egyptian independence in 1952. Much of Egypt looks like this. It's desert, dependent on the Nile. In some years, the river floods and there's extra water. Egypt's former president, Hosni Mubarak, had an ambitious plan to use the overflow to increase Egypt's arable land. When you know the story of Toshka, it's great. Fantastic. Metwali Salem is a reporter for the Egyptian newspaper El Masri El Yom. Mubarak's plan centered in this improbable place, Toshka, an empty corner of Egypt. Mubarak was flying over Toshka in the early 90s, and that year the Nile was especially high and the water entered Toshka. And so, the story goes, that's when he said, what about using the water to cultivate this land? Mubarak's idea was to use the overflow by building the largest pumping station in the world. The pump takes the water through a canal system that winds its way to the middle of the desert. In Mubarak's grand vision, these canals would turn the desert into the Cairo of the south. The transformation would draw Egyptians from across the country. The area would be filled with new farms and cities, fed by water from the high-tech canal system that draws water from the Nile. And it would solve all of Egypt's long-running problems, from unemployment to overcrowding. Despite high evaporation rates from the canal, despite the fact that the area is isolated, despite the lack of the infrastructure, despite the absence of transportation for the crops to get to the local and foreign markets, despite all of these things, Mubarak's projects went ahead.
The plan was supported only by the president's closest allies. It was hubris to believe the scheme could save Egypt. But Mubarak was willing to spend billions on infrastructure to bring the idea to life. But the project only got support from Mubarak's people. Now, the government is reviewing their plans to develop the Tashka project. The project today is a national joke. The water that was pumped in stands unused and for the most part is left to evaporate. There are no cities and only a few small farms. Its modern high-tech canals are left as a symbol of Mubarak's failure to solve Egypt's crises and his inability to address the reality of Egypt's future. The water in the Toshka canals stands in stark contrast to the water in much of the country. The Nile in more populated parts of Egypt is often choked with garbage and smells like sewage, like the water that flows into Hassan Husseini's village. This canal has, go, has come from more than 30 kilometers from uh, the Nile. This is the water for their crops. The problem is this garbage, as you see, is coming through this canal. And we're facing a big problem to clean this, because the government who are responsible to clean this canal, not us. The problem stems from the community's dependence on the government for reliable access to water. And it is a problem faced by people all across the country, particularly farmers like Ahmed Hamid. Okay. okay. My main job is here as a farmer on this land. Ahmed usually works on his father's farm just outside the city of Aswan. We caught up with him during the winter, farming's off season, and he told us about how a violent storm cut electricity to the city's pumping system two years ago and destroyed his crop. The season was not good because the water was cut off. I had to try and make up the difference with work elsewhere because my crops had died. I tried to work to make money and to buy things. The things I used to get from the land, I had to now buy from the market. Ahmed started driving a taxi to help the family. He left his father and extended family to tend to the farm. But his father Abdel Hamid remembers a simpler time, when the Nile would flood every year, fertilizing the soil. That was before the Egyptian government dammed the river to generate electricity and control the water. Before the high dam, the Nile would flood this entire area. We would find fish swimming in the ditches. We'd pick them out and grill them and eat them. But after the dam was constructed, there was a drought here. The large family today worries about what kind of access they'll have to water in the future. We need the water to come so we can plant. There will be a problem. Today, we have the entire Egyptian nation living off of the Nile. In a desert country where 80 million people are living off of one river, there's a tiny amount of traditional farmland, less than 5%. That means Egypt must find a way to take back the desert. It's what Mubarak tried and failed to do in Toshka. But that's because Toshka was in the middle of nowhere. In populated parts of Egypt, greening the desert has proved far more successful. The government since the 50s has really been promoting desert development as a way of attempting to alleviate this overcrowdedness. About a quarter, about 25 percent of the cultivated land service in Egypt is reclaimed desert. Desert reclamation has expanded the Nile Delta, where 60 percent of Egypt's crops are grown. The Desert Development Center, a venture of the American University in Cairo, shows farmers how to develop the reclaimed land. New land, which is actually a desert, uh, as you see, we all just live in 4 percent or 5 percent from our land, and the rest of our land is desert. Mohsin Nuara is the operations manager here. He teaches visiting farmers how to conserve water. Many Egyptian farmers still use flood irrigation, a wasteful method in which fields are drowned in water. What they're teaching here is more efficient drip irrigation. So the reclamation land is about 1 million acres right now, and we'd like to increase this uh, year by year to cover the demand of our food production. 
water is life actually. If we can divide the, the consumption of water, you can find 80% of our source of water we use it for agriculture. Agriculture is critical. It's still Egypt's biggest employer and keeping Egyptians working is vital to stability. It was unemployed youth who formed the backbone of last year's revolution, rallying around the demand, bread, freedom and social justice. When people write, they are uh, mostly uh, upset and angry about the cost of living and the, uh, the inability to cope with the uh, cost of living and higher food prices. For some, the family farm is insurance during times of economic struggle. Ahmed is 26 years old and has a degree in history, but he has no choice but to farm alfalfa. I graduated from college, but can't find work. So Ahmed returned home to work this small patch of land. And he's just one of the millions of Egyptians who would lose their means of survival if the water were to one day run out. And Egypt's problems are further complicated by its upstream neighbors, the nine other countries the Nile passes through. They have plans of their own. Until now, Egypt's water was secured because of a colonial era treaty which guaranteed Egypt a 90% share of the Nile. That means upstream countries like Ethiopia are forbidden to take even one drop out of the Nile without permission. Today, Egypt's neighbors are no longer satisfied with this arrangement. Ethiopia is developing very fast, has one of the fastest growing economies in Africa last year. And a major area for investment is in uh, water resources, particularly uh, building dams. There are four mega dam projects currently planned in Ethiopia. The largest is the massive Renaissance Dam. When completed, it will create a lake the size of Singapore. Egyptians are afraid this will greatly affect the amount of water that flows to them. Egypt would never object to a project that is for the economic development of Ethiopia. Hani Raslan is an analyst with the government-affiliated Al-Ahram Institute. Raslan represents the old guard in Egypt, the generation of analysts and politicos who came of age under Mubarak and view neighboring states as upstarts who don't have the right to demand a share of the Nile. Any further projects that decrease the amount of water in the river is a death sentence for Egypt. In the past, thanks to very savvy diplomacy and very subtle threats, Egypt has been able to remain in control. The nine countries along the Nile's path make up the Nile Basin, and together they are trying to change the way the water is apportioned. Six of the nine Nile Basin countries have signed an agreement that seeks to review the way the water is divvied up. It's an agreement that Egypt won't sign. Egypt would never go to war over that, but there are many other means to use to exert pressure and get what you want, but well short of total warfare. Total warfare may not be on the immediate horizon, but a new report from the U.S. government's Office of the Director of National Intelligence says water in shared basins will increasingly be used as leverage, and it predicts the use of water as a weapon or to further terrorist objectives. But the struggle is not just over water. These countries are vying for foreign investment, and the Nile is the draw for those dollars. It's the cash that builds dams in Ethiopia and keeps Egyptians employed. We need to attract capital. There is no question that capital is good for the country. Uh, but we need also to uh, establish a good balance. But if the investment is not aligned with the priorities, there is risk here. Because at the end, uh, the, the, there are huge profits that are being subsidized by very limited resources. Foreign investment is exactly what Hosni Mubarak hoped to attract with his grand Toshka project. So much so that he was willing to gamble two of Egypt's most endangered resources, money and water. They were hoping to get the bulk of the investment from the private sector, private investors. So they offered land and water at a very cheap arrangement if you would go develop a piece of land. And certainly that's what the Egyptians had hoped would happen in Toshka. But only one major company bought in, CADCO, the Kingdom Agricultural Development Company, owned by Saudi Arabia's Prince Al-Walid bin Talal, a major partner in many joint ventures with Mubarak's government. I would say the national attitude towards the project is it's too expensive. 
and that the money uh, could have been better used in some other way. And it's true, it's very expensive. Since the Egyptian revolution, the company has returned 75,000 acres. Prosecutors found the land buy was subject to the same shady dealings that plagued the former government. Today, any future for Toshka is up in the air. I think it's too early to say in a post-Mubarak Egypt what's going to happen with the policy towards Toshka. It really, really is. No one, no one is guessing. But the infrastructure is there. Hassan Husseini's village has none of the infrastructure or resources that were used to build Toshka. But Husseini has high hopes for his country's future. This, this revolution, we, we know very well this is a very, the best thing happened in Egypt, this revolution. But the, blow, the problem is after Hosni Mubarak stepped down and his regime, we have to think about the future. Husseini is cleaning up his garbage-choked canal in a grassroots campaign that began on Facebook and would not have been possible before last year. And we want to change this culture. The government will not do everything for you. You have to do something and the, govern and the government does others. So we, that we, we try to convince people to do. Start by yourself and the government will help you. And if the government don't help you, you motivate the government to do. That, says Hassan, is the whole point of the new Egypt, a democratic nation forged in the crucible of last year's uprising. Solutions won't be found by strongmen with far-fetched ideas and billions of dollars to squander. Instead, they will start at the village level, where there are plenty of smart, committed people who understand one fundamental truth. There is only one Nile, and millions of people depend on it. In the coming years, it will be Egypt's responsibility, and the responsibility of its neighbors, to preserve their river.